David Gilmour, the beating heart behind Pink Floyd, the amazing genius behind solos on songs like Echoes, Shine On You Crazy Diamond, and Comfortably Numb, one of the chief composers and instrumentalists in the amazing band of Pink Floyd, has created such an amazing impact on the guitar community. His influence and impact can be felt over generations of guitarists all around the world, and his music will still live on as some of the greatest of all time. David's contribution to music as a whole has also been felt on amazing albums that have stood the test of time as some of the greatest, such as The Wall and The Dark Side of the Moon. And David Gilmour has cemented his place in the guitar world as one of the greatest guitar players of all time, and also as one of the greatest musicians there has ever been. And in this video, legends of the past and present alike have come together to honor the amazing legacy of Mr. David Gilmour and everything that he has done for the amazing music community and his contribution to the world of music. So in this video, relax, buckle up, as we are about to embrace on a journey directly in in tribute of Mr. David Gilmore. Enjoy. If you enjoyed the video, please remember to leave a like, share, and subscribe for more great videos just like this. And until next time, I'll see you guys later. Let's get straight into it. Number eight, Brian May. I mean, I saw Deep Purple quite a few times, yeah. And I remember one particular time, which I've probably recounted before, where they played at my college um, and the power went. And I remember them... This is where I kind of learned what professionalism was because they, with with no power, the guy just, the front man who I think was Gillen, must have been Ian Gillen, yeah. I guess, yeah, just stood there and sort of told a few jokes, got the audience very, very much on their side and gradually things began to come back and they just took the, the audience to a new level once the power came back on. It was very good, very impressive. Number seven, Billy Corgan. I'd like to start uh, with some personal reflections. Um... I grew up in the 70s and 80s. I'm roughly uh, 28 years old. And when people would say Pink Floyd, before I even heard a note, there was a certain reverence that surrounded this band. They were a strange anomaly in the 70s filled with this horrible, awful music, which some of you in this room are responsible for. And uh, uh, Pink Floyd was this, this mix of so many things. They were a mysterious band. You didn't really know what they looked like most of the time. They had amazing artwork that had pyramids and prisms and crazy things. And the first album I heard was Dark Side of the Moon, which, as we all know, is probably one of the best albums of all time. It was their, probably their crowning achievement as far as people knowing what it was that they did. Uh, I first heard this album in the Wall era, which to me at my tender age of 14 was too creepy, too intense, too nihilistic, and uh, of course these are all the things I believe in now. And um, through Dark Side of the Moon, I, I sought out their other albums, and I, and I became a fan. And when I was 17 years old, my, uh, my grandmother was diagnosed with cancer. And it was one of the most painful periods of my life. And the Pink Floyd song, Wish You Were Here, seemed to sum up everything that I was feeling. And when I couldn't take what was going on in my life with her dying, I listened to that song over and over, and it still makes me cry. It's such a beautiful song. And, uh, you know, when you're 17... Heaven from hell, blue skies from pain, it means a lot. And so this is why I think I'm here at this particular moment to uh, thank them for everything that they've ever done. Um, Pink Floyd are the ultimate rock and roll anomaly. They sold massive amounts of records, have always been a popular live band, and they're not a, they were never a singles-driven band, a lesson forever needed to be learned in this particular business. Because they've always stood for been about music. And why? Because it is the people who listen to music that drives the business, not the other way around. And they've always been a band that's thought about the fan first. And I, I have a lot of respect for them about that. They've always been everything that's great about rock. Grandeur, pomposity, nihilism, humor, and of course, space. Um, so when I was asked to do this, I thought, well, you know, I could come out here and go on and on about the mystery and mythology of Pink Floyd, but I thought I'd actually go back and listen to a lot of the records that I had impressions with and had listened to, but go back as, a, as an adult, per se, and um, really kind of delve in. They've survived everything, and I don't personally know all the politics between them all, but we have the music as a legacy. So 
I personally, and I hope all of you, will salute the legacy of their bravery, courage, spirit, and ultimately their music. It's a great legacy, and I wish that uh, I wish them all well. Pink Floyd. Number six, Steve Miller. Unbeknownst to me, Pink Floyd had was they were fans of the Steve Miller band, and they had bought Children of the Future and Sailor, and thought those were great records. And I I didn't know that, and. Um, I got a call from my agent said, Pink Floyd uh, wants you to come and play with them in, in England. They're doing a festival. And I said, well, you know, I'm in the middle of writing right now, and I'm working on my album. I don't even have a band together. I haven't played in the last year and a half or whatever, and can't do it. And he said, well, you know, they, they really want you to do it. And I said, really, I can't do it. And I, I said, look, tell them I want $50,000. I can't do it. You know, and... Uh, they came called right back up and said, that'll be fine. And I went, what? <laughs> oh, no. You know. So I had to put a band together. And so I, uh, I called up Les Dudek, who played in Boz's band. He's a great guitar player. And Lonnie Turner, my bass player. And we needed a drummer, so I called Cosmo from Creedence Clearwater, who was a pal. And I said, listen, I got this, hey, guys, I got this gig in London. It's like, you know, on Thursday or whatever it was. And uh, you guys want to go and do it? And I, everybody said, yeah, yeah. So I said, okay, come on over to the house. So they came over to the house. And I had kind of, you know, kind of had cut the track and was beginning to work on this thing. And I thought to myself, like, this Pink Floyd gig, it's going to be terrible. They're going to put me on, you know, at dusk. They're not. I'm not going to have any stage lights. It's going to sound. Everybody, the sun will be setting in the audience's eyes. So everybody will be in a, a daze, and I'm just chum to, you know, get, warm things up. And of course, that wasn't going to be good enough, you know. So I I wrote "Rockin' Me" because I wanted to I wanted to have this song that would really move this audience. So we practiced it. And uh, you know, in the afternoon, and the next day we left for London, and then spent the night in London. And the next day we went out to what we thought was going to be a festival. I thought it was like they said a festival. I thought it was going to be fifteen thousand people. They said, "Oh no, it's going to be sixty thousand people." It turned out it was a hundred and twenty thousand people, and. Uh, we went out and did our, we just did a lot of Jimmy Reed, a bunch of blues, and then we ended the set with Rock and Me, and that was the first time it was ever played. Number five, Pete Townsend. Hearing Dave Gilmore play and sing Comfortably Numb while I was comfortably numb was like landing in heaven. It was an extraordinary performance to see and an extraordinary show. And the next morning wasn't so good, pretty young over. This year at Live 8, I watched delighted that Roger Waters was back in the band again. I mean, I never ever thought it would happen. And another wall came down, I think. The wall between Dave and the other guys in the band and Roger. It was a, a, a great, fantastic moment for all of us who are friends of them all. And I've never chosen to try to understand what makes splintering bands splinter in the first place. And together again, they triumphed. I think you'll all agree. They marked a great day with some humility and some perspective. And uh, from the moon, the UFO club, the world, the universe, four lovely English chaps and a lost genius called Sid, I give you Pink Floyd. Number four, Paul McCartney. Floyd came in after us, yes. Pink Floyd, and, and did a lot of cool experimental stuff. This was more Wings period, but they were next door, making Dark Side of the Moon. Wow. Well, that was pretty cool. Did you get to hear anything? Did you listen ever? Yeah. The engineers were quite interchangeable. Yes. So an engineer that would work on their stuff would work on ours, and he'd, he'd play us some, some, some of the Dark Side of the Moon stuff. Number three, Jeff Beck. I, I, I may have seen them at the Speakeasy Club in London. Yeah. But because it was so dark in there, and they were all prismatic, you know, that psychedelic life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, they could have changed personnel every day and you wouldn't have noticed. It was the weirdest show. I didn't know show. Yeah. about a week ago that they were after me. <laughs> yeah, that's, I mean, they said they were all afraid to ask ask you to come be in the band. Oh, yeah. They were afraid? They said they were so nervous. They were so nervous. They, they Nobody would have enough nerve to come in and oh, ask you to oh. play, to take Sid Barrett's place. How oh, incredible is that? Yeah. 
I never would have thought that it was going to be the light of day, you know. But oh no, that was, that, I mean that was, you know. But I think everybody good. feels like that, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that and the, and the Rolling Stones, I could have, you know, I'd have been all right financially, couldn't I? <laughs> uh, it would not have been bad. Uh, no, I don't know. I wasn't ever in the stars. I probably wouldn't have, you know. That I couldn't feel the calling. Yeah. Ha having whoops, I just whacked that thing. Uh, either with the stones, I, I, you know, there was something going on up there that definitely would have prevented either of those from happening. Number two, Jimmy Page. But that's the thing with the electric guitar. Um, apart from the fact that it's fueled by, by um, your imagination. But also, if you have a guitar sort of against that wall and uh, an amplifier, each guitarist would come in there play, but they'd still sound like Eric and they'd still sound like Jeff or like me or whoever. David Gilmour, the fact is that it's still just one guitar, no effects pedals, but it's, it's a tactile instrument and that has a lot to do with the way that your, your sound is, along with the sort of character playing that reinforces it. Number one, Jimi Hendrix. Who are the people that, uh, I mean, you ha you've already expressed uh, appreciation in one paper of Pink Floyd. What are the, the things that you admire about Pink Floyd and the things they're doing? Oh yeah, well they're doing like a different type of music. They're doing more of like a space type of thing. I mean, inner space, it seems like, you know. And like, uh, you know, technically, you know, they're getting electronics and all this. Right. Yeah, they do like a space type of thing, like an inner space type of thing. And, uh, you know, sometimes you have to lay back by yourself and appreciate them, you know. That's the type of music they're into, it's, it's good. But like, I think I'd want to make mine a little more easier with a better, you know, with like with a solid beat, probably. Mm -hmm. More beat. So what did you guys think? Did you enjoy the video? If you did, please remember to leave a like, share, and subscribe. And comment down below on your favorite Pink Floyd song or a David Gilmore tune. And until next time, I'll see you guys later.